Judah, mm -hmm. I'm 60, and I'm a writer. I'm 60, and I'm a writer. I'm 60, and I'm a writer. <clears throat> For the last several years, I've been wiped out, exhausted. Is this my life in middle age? If that's true, what do I have to look forward to in my 60s? This sudden drop of energy going from 60 to zero in the space of a few years? Didn't feel like normal aging. But when have I ever been normal? I went from one doctor to another. Those doctors said I had low thyroid and almost no vitamin D. I gobbled pills, capsules, supplements, all for nothing. Was I blue? Well, waking up at 7 a.m. exhausted after wrestling with my pillow all night and losing was depressing. One day I stumbled upon an article on sleep apnea on the internet. Fatigue, low mood, waking up at night gasping for air, check, check, and check. Once or twice a month for the last 20 years, I wake up gasping, my heart pounding. I wrote it down to nerves. I mean, sleep apnea was the domain of overweight snorers, and I was neither. Well, one day last fall, I finally went over to the sleep clinic at Mount Auburn Hospital, where they fitted me with a small device designed to measure my uh, heart rate, oxygen level, and the number of times I stopped breathing during the night. <coughs> Two weeks later, I got my report. I stopped breathing. <laughs> 56 times during the seven hours I was on the monitor. And my oxygen level dropped to 85%. Now anything below 90 is considered dangerous. Being both a researcher and a hypochondriac, <laughs> I panicked when I discovered I was at risk for minor medical events, uh, like a heart attack, a stroke, or a sudden death. This is my life in middle age, a betrayal of the body. Now the gold standard treatment was a CPAP machine, a helpful device about the size of a loaf of bread complete with control panel, mask, and hose. The sleep technician told me that the device would take a little getting used to, but that getting my apnea under control was vital because every time I stopped breathing, it put a strain on my heart. Bad news in a family where the men tend to die young from heart disease. But there was one problem. With a mask and hose, I could only sleep in one position, on my back. And that led to another problem. I can't sleep on my back. I sleep on my stomach or on my side, not splayed out on my back with a machine forcing air down my throat. <laughs> Well, over Christmas break, I tried one mask and then another. The first mask was small, light, and fit over my nose with plugs that went into each nostril. But those nostrils were congested, and just as I finally fell asleep, my mouth opened and I was blasted with air, which woke me up. So. I tried a full face mask, well designed for scuba diving, <laughs> if not for sleep. Now, when I first saw the mask, I thought, what will this do to my already non-existent social life? <laughs> do sleep apnea sufferers only date each other? <laughs> Would I be consigned to a subculture of gay apniacs? <laughs> Wasn't being gay, Jewish, hard of hearing, and from Cleveland enough? <laughs> now, when I first got my report, I was told that apnea was a serious disease 
and that compliance in using my CPAP regularly was very important. Each night, my machine would send off my data to the technicians at Mount Auburn so that if I didn't use the machine regularly, my insurance company would refuse to pay and my CPAP would be repossessed. But after a few nights, it became clear that I couldn't sleep with the damn thing. Back to the drawing board. Back to the internet for more research. Well, after a three-month wait, I got in to see a dentist who fit me with a mouthpiece or oral device, a hard plastic retainer, which moves my teeth and lower jaw forward <laughs> through the night so that I look a bit more like the Neanderthal I am. I wear it nightly, drooling and salivating like one of Pavlov's dogs, but my throat is open and I can breathe better. Now, if I could just digest my food and poop naturally, <laughs> my life would be complete. Why do I write? Writing is for me both physically and emotionally painful. An anxious, restless man, I find sitting for more than 15 minutes to be extremely difficult. The physical act of writing, my body hunched over a notebook or tensed over laptops, <coughs> leads to backaches, a stiff neck, a tight gut. Am I whining? <laughs> I'm told that Ernest Hemingway wrote Standing Up. How would Ernest view my unwillingness to face the blank page? What a whip, he'd mutter. How does that compare to staring down a leering lion or a raging rhinoceros? Is this chapter four or chapter five? What do I call this stage I'm entering in which I'm giving up steady work I don't like for the gift of time, more time? A gift or a curse? It all depends on how I handle semi-retirement or working part-time or whatever I choose to call it. You see, at 60, my clock is ticking as it was at 50, but now the ticks are louder in my bad ears. And the years to come are finite, a precious resource, like water in the Southwest. You see, I was born in 1957, the expansive peak of the baby boom, and now we are skittering toward old age, kicking and screaming the whole way. Do not go gentle into that good night. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. As a young man, a boy really, I memorized Dylan Thomas's poem for my introduction to sign language course at Northwestern University. I was 20. And like a trained parrot, I echoed Thomas's words without really understanding their meaning. I mean, what did I know of death or life at 20? Today, I know a lot more and have no illusions about where this train is heading, though I don't want to look. Still, I'm lucky to have now, today, to be productive, creative, inspired, or so I hope. And I still want a boyfriend, though that doesn't feel like the right term for a 50 or 60 year old man. Companion might be better, but that sounds like we would hold hands and sleep in separate beds like the married couple in a 50s sitcom. I will not go gentle into that good night and don't want to think about that for a while. But now today at dusk, I wonder who or what comes next. I'm Judah, I'm 60, and I'm a writer. Why do I write? 
The physical pain pales before the emotional upset of rooting around in my unhappy childhood. My childhood dance with depression, which lasted till I was past 40, the depression, not my childhood, <laughs> led me to unhappiness, or did the unhappiness lead me to depression? Why do I write? My writing career is as follows. A column in the local gay newspaper, which pays me enough for dinner and a movie, for one. <laughs> a self-published book that took me 10 years to write and sold a few hundred copies. Public radio pieces for which I was paid nada, zero, zilch. It's four days before my show. The first time in my life I've ever gone totally off the page. Just me alone on stage. And it's not Carnegie Hall, but the Cambridge, Massachusetts Center for Adult Education. But 60 people have bought tickets. And I don't want to suck to bore them or embarrass myself. Now this, telling pieces of my life stories if somebody might care, is something I've wanted to do since I was four years old when there wasn't much to tell. Well, back then I had confidence galore and felt worthy of others' time and attention. I mean, after all, my grandmother, Nanny Frieda, said I was a talented little boy, a wonderful singer and dancer. Who was I to doubt her? <laughs> but over time, I lost that confidence, replacing it with frustration and envy when I watched others living out their creative dreams and mine moldered, decaying like a moth-eaten sweater. Now, after decades of procrastination, I am finally moving forward. I've been working toward this moment for, in fits and starts for years, rehearsing for the past four months, memorizing, timing, blocking myself on stage. Now, my show is a low-tech affair with a cast of one and a crew, including my director, Adam, who's handling the lights, and another friend who is doing sound, of two. So Adam and I are heading toward Harvard Square toward the small performance space where soon, God willing, I will do my show. Now, I don't have a budget or a real set, but thanks to Adam, I have four flats made of muslin, stretched canvas over wood, painted to resemble a city skyline. They're property of his community theater troupe in Wakefield, north of Boston. Now, we're transporting them on the roof of Adam's car, a mid-sized Subaru, a hair too small to fit the eight foot high by four foot wide flats. But Adam has a plan, which involves lashing the flats to the car's luggage rack, snaking rope through the driver and passenger side windows, and covering the whole thing with a plastic tarp, protection from the dark sky which is spitting a misty rain. I follow Adam slowly down residential streets, and the tarp flies away. But the weather holds, at least for now, and we turn on to Interstate 93, going 35, 45, 55 miles an hour. I'm several car lengths behind him for safety, anxious to get to the center where we have the space for just a couple hours of rehearsal before another group takes over. Then the flats, a rectangular clump on the Suru's roof, shift, and I think about calling Adam on my cell, but then it's too late. The flaps are airborne, spinning, crashing back to earth. I slam on my brakes and pull over to the side of the road. Adam pulls over too, and we watch open mouth as a series of vehicles swerve toward us, trying with varying degrees of success to avoid the flaps. Then a big truck pulls up, a 16-wheeler, puts on his flashers, which gives Adam and me a chance to run out on the highway, grab the flats, and run back to the safety of the guardrail. While well, I look at Adam, he looks at me. Screw it, he says. And we pitch the flats, two still intact and two crushed through, over the guardrail, and jump back in our cars. So back at the center, we piece together a set, black curtains, and two Japanese screens I find in a storage space. Then we run a rehearsal, and in one scene, I forget to put on my pants, showing up in my red boxers and black socks. The next day goes a little better, but I still flub several lines. 
Now I've memorized, repeated, chanted these stories like a mantra for two months and then four, until I know them all by heart, until I'm sick of them, and now I am strangely calm, given that the show has sold out and 70 people are coming to see me on this very night. It's a Saturday in November, mild and clear, and I'm counting down hours, minutes, seconds, and I'm relaxed, detached, and this is not me. Or have I, after two decades of therapy, really changed? But then it's lunchtime, and I'm trying not to think about it. But I've got too much time, energy, thoughts, and the self-destructive voice that is woven into my mind, heart, solar plexus, screams in my ear until I give in. What gives you the right to do a show? How fucking self-indulgent. What have you done in your, 30, in your 50 plus years on this planet that gives you the right to take up space? My show is about striving for love, sex, self-acceptance, of wanting but of not quite getting. Where's the drama in that? This is bad mind, evil mind, my inner critic snickering that I am not enough, will never be enough, and why don't I get back in my shoebox and close it? And then I'm standing in a drafty hallway outside the stage door, and I hear the hum of the crowd. People were there to see me. And it's 15 minutes, 10 minutes, five minutes till showtime. And my director says, whenever you're ready. And I walk in, and I'm blinded by the light, can't see past the second row. But my body knows what to do, what to say, how to move. Words flow off my tongue, and I'm lifted by laughter, silence, a sense that I am not alone, and the critic is strangely quiet, at least for now. And then I'm changing behind one of those Japanese screens I found after my scenery died on Interstate 93. And I checked the set list, and there's just one story left. Did I forget something? But no, 45 minutes compressed into five, because I'm in the zone, four years old, performing for my grandmother. And I know in that moment that I want more. And that this is the only story I can tell a story of a life not of great triumph and tragedy, but simply of one man doing the best he can, or the best he knows how, which is almost the same thing. Ah. 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 I invite a man home for the first time. Let's call him Sven. He's Swedish. And we've been out twice before because I'm not that easy. And I'm shy, especially when it comes to sex. And now we're going to do it, and I've invited him to spend the night. Hmm. Picture him, my sexy, earthy, hunky date. He's lean, muscled, sapphire eyes and golden hair, a killer smile. He's 45, but likes older men, fit older guys like me. He pulls me in for a kiss, sucks my tongue, licks my chest. His cool Scandinavian breath merges with mine as our bodies meld together. He pushes me down against the bed. As he twists my, uh, my body into a series of foreign shapes, a new form of partner yoga. I worship him as the minutes become hours until we unwind into two separate cells and our bodies are spent. He flashes a dentine smile, which leads to a final kiss. And I reach out to pull my nightstand closer. It's where I store my gear, tackle, equipment. Picture him as he scans my nightstand, as he takes in the devices I need to breathe, sleep, to make it through the night. His luscious lips, a soft circle of surprise. Here are the tools of my trade. A CPAP machine about the size of a loaf of bread, complete with control panel, mask, and hose. An atomizer with eye wash for my dry eyes, gel for my dry eyes, and a sleep mask 
to keep gel and eye wash in dry eyes. Nasal strips to promote breathing. <laughs> Mouthpiece, which moves my teeth and jaw forward during the night to keep my throat open so I can breathe and antidepressant medication to knock me out so I can sleep during the night. <laughs> Picture him as he shakes his blonde head, pulls on his boxer briefs, and mumbles something about an early morning meeting, a doctor's appointment, a fire sale. So Sven, how do you like me now? How do you say CPAP in Swedish? I'm too sexy for my CPAP, too sexy for my eyelids, too sexy for my nose drip, too sexy for my mouthpiece, too sexy for my gel. It was all a dream. Sort of like when Bobby Ewing woke up on Dallas and he wasn't really dead. It had all been a bad dream, or in this case a good one, until Sven left me bereft, even in my own fantasy. I'm 60, and I'm a writer. I'm driving back from Rochester, New York, and the first time I've been sponsored by an actual theater, even if it is a small one. The multi-use community cultural center called Muck by Insiders offered me one night in their black box theater in a converted Baptist church. Now, even though I had no idea how or if I would draw an audience, I didn't want to pass up the chance to take my show on the road and tell my stories in a new city. Well, now, driving back on the New York Thruway on a Sunday afternoon from Rochester to Boston, I wonder if I've made a mistake. You see, maybe the idea of taking a show on the road was cool, but the reality was more problematic. You see, two days earlier, on my way out from Boston to Rochester, I'd fallen into a serious funk with only the chatter of my mind for company. As I drove, I dwelt on the fact that I was single without a partner, lover, significant other, and that I was getting old in late middle age. My critics snickered that I was solo, single, a loser, who would never find a lover who would stick around. The throughway, a flat, drab ribbon of highway stretched before me, and I wondered why I'd agreed to travel 400 miles to perform in a dark theater for a bunch of people I didn't know. Still, I managed to hold off a deeper funk once I got to Rochester. You see, I had a tech rehearsal, and then half a day to explore the city, which looked really nice on a sunny day in June. So here's the scene on that Saturday night. It's about 15 minutes before the show, and I'm not too nervous. I mean, I've done the show before. But I look into the dark space of the theater, black floor, black walls, black chairs. <coughs> no people. And the box office has sold only, give me a number. 14. <laughs> Three. Three tickets. But then a group of about 10 people trickle in, half of them connected with the theater, and I spring into action. Now, the stage lights are in my eyes, so I can't see my audience. So I have to depend on sound, laughter, applause, breathing, to know that they're engaged, awake, alive, not fast asleep or wicked bored or dead. <laughs> but no sound comes from the audience. I'm cut off from them by the glare and can't see past the second row, in which sits an older man, round face, short dark hair, mustache, and what looks like a permanent scowl, as if he just sucked on a lemon or was enduring something painful, like a root canal. Now, I have several friends in the audience, one from Toronto and one from Syracuse, and they must be enjoying the show more than this old guy who was holding on, white-knuckling it through my show. 
uh, I pull myself back to the present, we're on to stories number two, three, four, and I forget about old stone face because I'm moving props, chairs, changing clothes, and the stage lights come up, and the audience is applauding loudly. One of Muck's directors tells me how much he enjoys the show, and I go out with my friends on a wave of good feeling knowing that I slayed the crowd, or at least kept them awake. Now by Sunday afternoon, the next day, I'm anxious to get home. I jump on the New York Thruway and head east, zipping along at 75 miles an hour. Uh, when I come upon one of those electronic billboards, which says, the Thruway is closed east of Syracuse. All <coughs> lanes are blocked due to an accident. We are to seek alternate routes. I know no alternate routes. For the next two hours, I circle Syracuse, looking for a way out. Eventually, I end up on a two-lane road, which takes me through rolling countryside, which might have been nice if I wasn't desperately trying to get the fuck out of New York State. <laughs> well, I finally wind around to the throughway, which has reopened in my absence, and speed toward Boston, arriving home exhausted at 11 p.m. Back home, I decided to check my email before bed. And my eye is caught by the subject line, deception, exclamation point. It seems that one of my fans has flamed me, upset that my show was not about the historical Middle Ages, <laughs> which he helpfully defined as a period between 1,000 and 1280. <laughs> Evidently, he was expecting a humorous tour through the Black Plague, the Crusades, and other knee slappers. <laughs> Did he really think you were that old? The French chimes in via Facebook. Mm -hmm. Well, I figured out by process of elimination that my correspondent was the older man in the second row, the one who looked like he just sucked on a lemon. Even though he had not read anything beyond the title, which was One Man's Journey Through the Middle Ages. Nothing on website or flyer. I was at fault for taking his money, all $10, <laughs> and was a deceptive, clever Jew. Ooh. Yeah. I forwarded the email to Muck's directors, one of whom responded, that's like expecting Gone with the Wind to be about the weather. <laughs> now, despite my anti-Semitic fan and my low turnout, I returned to Muck and to Rochester three months later as part of the Rochester Fringe Festival. Uh, even though there were a bunch of other shows going on, I drew about 25 people on a rainy afternoon they laughed, sighed, and applauded. I didn't see the older man from the previous uh, June. Still, he occupies a place in my mind's eye where he sits in the second row <coughs> conferring with my inner critic. I wanted damsels in distress. <laughs> Narrative drive, dramatic tension. Knights in shining armor. He's not an actor. It's not historically accurate. <laughs> this has been done before. He's not very funny. <laughs> I tried to tell him. I'm Judah. I'm 60. And I'm a writer. Why do I write? Because I cannot sing, draw, or play a musical instrument. Because I am a damn good dancer. But who wants to watch a middle-aged white man dance? Because I want to tell stories. And unlike James Fry, I lack the imagination to make stuff up. Why do I write? Because going back to my childhood, the scene of the crimes, the busted hip, razored arm, twisted gut, I find some humor among the wreckage. 
telling stories from my point of view, the adult inserted into the frame, I realized I came out the other side, even if it took me 50 years to do so. The Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary is a maze of offices, examination rooms, reception desks. I've been there the previous fall for my dry eyes, for which there seems to be no effective treatment. Well, now I'm back for another intractable condition, the frustration and, and indignity of losing most of the hearing in my left ear, which has left me struggling to capture words, to locate sound. After 10 years of life as a hard of hearing man, in which I learned to wear a hearing aid and then gave up because it did little to no good, I'm back waiting to meet with a renowned surgeon who operated on a friend of mine and brought back most of his hearing. But my loss is complex, a mix of middle and inner ear. I know there's no miracle cure that will bring back all of my hearing. Still, I'm hoping the surgery might help me restore some of what I've lost. I wander back through the second floor maze to audiology where I meet a young woman with curly black hair who introduces herself as Dr. So-and-so and asks me why I'm there. I give her a quick rundown. Sudden hearing loss in my left ear, unknown origin, uh, little benefit and much frustration with my hearing aid, and uh, my reliance on my good right ear. Then she fastened headphones on me and puts a metal clamp on the left side of my skull to measure something called bone conduction to see if my inner ear and auditory nerve are still working. Then she tests my hearing in the left ear And there are long periods of silence as I struggle to figure out if I'm hearing something or if I'm just feeling the weight of those faint beeps. Now, back in college where I majored in deaf education, I took courses in acoustics, the physics of sound, and introduction to audiology, promptly forgetting most of what I learned. You see, I was going to teach deaf children using sign language. And though some of those children would have hearing aids, that wasn't my area of interest. Well, now I was on the other side of that equation, not deaf, not fully hearing. The test goes on with speech recognition. A man in a monotone saying, you will say arm. Arm, you will say boat. Boat, but even though those words are blasting into my left ear at 110 decibels, louder even than the subway trains when they sh shriek into Davis Square Station in Boston, I miss one word, and then another, and there are 20 words, 50, what feels like 100, and I am sweating through my shirt, exhausted. I wait for my audiogram, that graph with its collapsing lines of X's and O's, which tell me what I already know, that I am defective, my warranty is up, and I cannot complain to the manufacturer. <laughs> The surgeon, a 40-ish Asian-American man, comes in, looks at my audiogram, and tells me what I want to hear, sort of. He says I'm a good candidate for surgery because most of my loss is in the middle ear, what they call conductive. It's a mechanical problem, he says, explaining that depending on what he finds, he can replace one of the tiny bones in my middle ear with a prosthetic. Of course, there are no guarantees and uh, there's a chance that I could become totally deaf in my left ear, but given that I had little usable hearing there anyway, what did I have to lose? Now he says that the fix is possible because my auditory nerve is barely hanging on. However, <laughs> restoring the connection will not cure your disease. <laughs> I never thought of this as a disease, I said. Well, it is he said, with the bluntness of a surgeon who is running 90 minutes late. It's all about connection. I want to hear, speak, take up space, get my mind and body in working order before they fall apart. Everything falls apart sooner or later. 
I can't breathe at night, can't, can't hear. My eyes are dry and gritty, my own inland desert. The doctors know so little but say so much, propose solutions that don't work. It's like Joni Mitchell saying back in the 60s, you don't know what you got till it's gone. <laughs> I will go under the knife, cover my nose and mouth, suck air greedily into my lungs, try to sustain myself. Air is free, I tell my students. Get it while you can. <coughs> or maybe not, I would tell them now. It comes delivered through a plastic tube, inflating and deflating through the night. I am tethered to it, mechanical man. My normal eyes, ears, and breath are imperfect and barely hanging on. I'm suspended between youth and old age trying to hold on to what I've got. Don't it always seem to go that you don't know what you've got till it's gone? Why do I write? Because I am middle-aged and time passes like a bullet train racing through the French countryside. Because a producer, an editor, a reader told me they could relate. Because I am lonely, self-absorbed, staring at my navel. Why do I write? Because like Dorothy Parker, I hate writing, but love having written in those rare moments when something I've written is actually worth reading. Because Parker and Hemingway are dead, and here I am talking about them because Ernest Hemingway wrote Standing Up, and Dorothy Parker had a way with words. I'm in a black box theater in Minneapolis, Minnesota, 1,500 miles away from home, in the middle of a story, one of the emotional highlights of my show, when Soft Cell's 1981 hit, Tainted Love, comes wafting out of the sound. May the love we shall <laughs> Leaving me stunned and confused. It's performance number three of my five at the Minnesota Fringe, and after my first two shows drew crowds of five and eight people respectively, I'm thrilled to have an actual audience of 25 people who've come out to see me on a hot summer night. Now I pull them in. Uh, several guys off Scruff, a gay dating website, a former housemate who moved out to the Midwest and who brought her boyfriend, her teenage son, and his girlfriend, and several other people who came from the festival website when five of the eight people at my second show posted five-star reviews. That's a hint for y'all. <laughs> now, it's early in my performance, and I'm doing a show called, I'm doing a story called What a Fellowship. It's about my visit to my African-American godmother, Donna's Black Baptist Church in Cleveland. See, I was back in Cleveland on vacation when Donna asked me if I would take her to a memorial service for her son, Lonnie, who had died two years earlier. So since, since Donna's a senior member or mother of the church, the service was doubling as an afternoon fundraiser for the building fund. So here's the scene at the church. This is the story I was telling. The next day, I'm at the church, the only white person in the sanctuary, a gay Jew, and the minister calls me up to speak, introducing me as Donna's other son, who's come all the way from Boston to be here for Mother Donna. Well, I went from white to crimson, <laughs> wondering how Donna's grandchildren, the children of her real son, would feel about that introduction. But knowing how much she loved him, how could I say no? Now, after my little speech, I sat back down in my pew, relieved and exhausted. Then the minister threw open the floor for other testimonies, and I waited for Lonnie's children to share. It didn't happen. Instead, there was a long silence. Now, I wanted my Minnesota audience to feel the weight of that silence, the awkwardness of that moment. But instead of silence, 
Tainted love comes rolling out of the sound booth, while Mark, the technician provided by the festival, sits oblivious, playing with his phone. Unaware that the audio track, which is supposed to run between, but not during my stories, is rolling along. And if I can hear it, a hard of hearing man, so can my audience. Well, I mutter, seeth, curse, and finally turn to my left and say, turn off the music, we can hear it. Then I jump back into character, or try to, explaining that though Lonnie's children didn't share, one of his cousins did, and the family was fine with my little eulogy. Okay, now at the end of the story, uh, as the lights go down, I'm supposed to sing the chorus of a gospel song that I wrote. I'm a gay Jew, it came to me in the shower. <laughs> and it goes like this. <clears throat> Jesus is my flashlight, Jesus is my guiding light. When I'm alone in the dark of night, Jesus says, gonna be all right. But just as I open my mouth to say, <laughs> At the end of the next story, the lights go down as planned. But the little blue light upstage, which I depend on to find my props, chairs, and clothes, is nowhere to be found while I stumble around in the darkness searching for my pants. By now, I am royally pissed. I lose one line and then another, as I wonder what screw up is going to come next. Now maybe this is payback. You see, at my tech rehearsal a few days earlier, Mark told me that I was supposed to wait outside the theater until he came and let me in. And then I have about 10 minutes to set up before the audience came in. But the show before mine finished 30 minutes early. And so I quietly walked through the theater to get down to the basement where my props are stored. Well, as I walked in, Mark yelled out, we're not open yet, as if I'd just stolen his wallet. I'd broken protocol by walking through the theater early. Evidently, I was supposed to wait outside the building in the parking lot until he came and unlocked the door. Now that seemed crazy to me, especially on a rainy night, but I apologized and then I was off doing my show for those people until Mark broke protocol by sleepwalking through my show. Now after his last mistake, when I started to lose my lines, I told myself to get it together. I'd come too far and worked too hard to let a bored tech ruin my show. And so I did pull it together, so the audience barely noticed my offstage drama. Now, at the end of the show, I'm packing up my things. Mark says something about, well, I just don't know what happened with that music, but uh, I'm leaving a note for the other tech. You see, there was another tech who was going to be doing my last two shows. So I was done with Mark. And those last two shows went off without a hitch. But I'll never hear Tainted Love, a song I used to love dearly quite the same way. Why do I write? Because when I read books, I think, I can do this, and it's like a dare, and I am stuck back again in my life because I do not write fiction in French like Hemingway, and I get depressed when I haven't written. Why do I write? Because I'm still alive, performing, performing because I'm stubborn, breathing, greedy to grab more light, dick, air, because I want money but need connection, listeners, all ears on deck. So this is my life in middle age, but who am I kidding? At 60, I'm not in the middle of anything, unless I live to be 120, but have tipped heavily to one side. The side of not quite old, but getting there. And how do I back up and turn this clown car around? <laughs> Entering my seventh decade, as one of my friends helpfully reminded me on my birthday, <laughs> I am older than most houses, trees, and some towns. I'm trying not to think about that, but it's like a pirate radio station that's playing in my mind. I'm on a Mexican radio. I'm on a Mexican, whoa, radio. Anybody know that song from the early 80s? You all know what a pirate radio station is? Yeah. What is it? 
It can like broadcast from a ship or offshore. So this is the idea. Okay. So we're all aging. Are you all aging? No. No? Well, this is an audience in denial. Denial is not just a river in Egypt. Okay. Well, I don't want to feel like I'm alone in this, so this is where I'm going to pull you all in a little bit. So this is very simple. Can you all sing? Yeah. No. So far what I've heard in, in Regina and here um, has not been, uh, well, I, I call it prairie soul. We'll see what you all do. So it's just basically like a call and response thing. So I'm just going to sing this line. I'm on a Mexican radio. I'm on a Mexican radio. Let's do that once more. I'm on a Mexican radio. I'm on a Mexican radio. This is the hard part. I'm on a Mexican, whoa, radio. Well, you all, you all tied Regina. <laughs> Hopefully you'll do better at the football game too. So how do I end the show without that one happy moment, that satisfying conclusion when our hero, who would be me, conquers all? Anxiety, self-doubt, bad reviews, all would be vanquished, slayed like St. George or his Jewish equivalent and the dragon. The audience would leave inspired, uplifted, <coughs> buoyed by the triumph of the human spirit and all that. But back in the real world, in my life, I can only tell you the truth. Because like I told you before, I lack the imagination to make stuff up. I want to make the most of the time I have left to wring the life out of my remaining days like a dish rag. To leave something, a book, a story, and friends who remember me behind. I'm Judah, I'm 60, and I'm a writer. I have my mouthpiece, my eye wash, my nose strips. I have sleep apnea, dry eye, and my dreams for a better life. Mouthpiece. <laughs> <laughs> No shrimp. <laughs> I war. Keep out. Bow peace. No shrimp. I war. Keep out. Bow peace. No shrimp. I war. Keep out. Yeah. <sighs>